What would happen if that character in your favorite movie or show came to life? I know I enjoy watching movies like Freddy Krueger and Halloween and I certainly wouldn't want to wake up to Freddy Krueger and definitely wouldn't want to run into the guy with a mask. But what happens when our favorite characters are not the heroes and all of a sudden they become a reality? This is Letty, your host, and this is The Mystery Theory. And today we're gonna get to know the real Dexter. I don't know about you, but I love the show Dexter. I haven't finished the seasons available, but it's it's definitely kind of a darker. Mm, I don't even know how to describe it. The idea is that he is a spatter expert, forensic, working for the police, and he basically it's like a justice vigilante I don't know how to call it but he knows about bad guys and he does pretty creepy things to them and gets rid of them and since he works for the police then he has to go to the crime scenes and it's again it's interesting it's mm, kind of I don't know it kind of makes you think in a different way that I don't know I like that much and at the same time there is some sense of justice because these people were really not good people but I, 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 I would I don't think it's such a great idea to still get rid of people that way but if you are a fan of Dexter maybe this case will be something that um, will put us in a reality that we've only seen on TV. But let's talk about Johnny Altinger. Uh, he was getting ready for a date. It was a Friday night and this was before the Canadian Thanksgiving long weekend. He was excited to meet this girl that he met online. And for those of you who think um, who are not from Canada or the US, uh, we both have Thanksgiving, but they are on different dates. However, this is a long weekend. So, and he's been looking forward to this long weekend, okay? Because they seem to like each other with this girl, Jen. They've been emailing and keeping in touch for a while, and now it was finally time to meet in person. They met on this dating website, Plenty of Fish, and her picture was stunning. I mean, a beautiful brunette, she was at the beach, and um, according to Johnny's friends, they would describe Johnny as more of a nerdy looking kind of guy. I don't know if that puts a picture in your head, but according to some people, she was probably a 10 for him and he felt like she was way out of his league, but he was super excited um, to be the guy that she was interested in. I mean, it, this beautiful girl is interested in him. He was excited. Okay, so his friends were a bit confused. And which I thought it was a little bit cruel and a little bit, um, I don't know, but you know, this interesting couple, um, it's not, it was not only about the appearance thing, okay, but other things because, um, this was going to be more of a casual encounter, 
and not I'm looking for a partner kind of encounter. Um, it was not like let me get to know you kind of thing. This was more of a how can we call it a booty call kind of thing. So another weird things and why Johnny's friends were worried is that she gave him directions and not an address. I mean, maybe she was trying to protect herself, which is a valid thing. Maybe she wanted to peek and see if that was the same guy from the picture and decide there if she wanted to see him or not. You never know. But maybe she was just protecting herself. And even though it was pretty weird or different he still you know wanted to go and meet her but despite the, the friends being worried I mean what are you gonna do what are you <laughs> are you gonna burst this bubble uh, maybe you're not the most popular I'm gonna call it popular cause I'm, it's I just think that calling it some other way is just too mean but you're you're not the most popular appearance you don't have the most popular appearance maybe you're not the 10 that most people look for according to today's standards in society and she's a 10 why does she like you? I mean why directions? why a booty call? I mean the friends were all asking Johnny these valid questions she's beautiful she doesn't need to go on a website not that you're on a website because you're not pretty but if she wanted something physical that's the thing she didn't need to create a profile engage in some kind of an internet relationship just to have some casual sex you know what I mean so all those things were kind of brewing in Johnny's friends' minds. So, according to this um, article that I read, he decided to send those specific instructions to get to Jen's place, which was a garage, and uh, or the place that they were going to meet. It was that garage really all we know is that he decided to email these directions to Dell which was this worried friend or one of them anyways so Dell says you know what Johnny once you get there just email me the address so or call me and send me the out you know just to be safe and um once Johnny follows the directions and gets to the garage place where he's supposed to meet Jen and this is something I found in most um, accounts um, articles things but there are some other versions that said that this didn't happen but according to the most reliable information that I could find Johnny ends up calling Dell and says, listen, I got here, Jen is not here, and there's a filmmaker guy here, so I do not understand what's going on. Now, as a friend, I'm assuming that Dell was like, <laughs> I'm not going to make the guy feel worse, that he got stood up or whatever. So Dell doesn't really ask him what are you gonna do, but he assumes that he left and that he went back home, and that Jen was really a lie, and um, you know he felt bad for his friend because he was gonna go home, and thinking that somebody was just messing around with him. However, at seven thirty p.m. Dell receives an email that says, Don't worry, I found Jen. We're having a great time. I just wanted to let you know. 
was at that point that I was like, weird, I guess, but good for you, my friend Johnny, right? Right? So, Dale, before going to bed that night, calls his friend Johnny again to check and see how it went with Jen. But it seemed like the phone was charged and everything, but it went to voicemail. The next day, nothing. He kept calling and went to voicemail. Um, that was Saturday. Uh, he talks to another... Uh, he talks to other people that were friends with Johnny as well. They call. He doesn't answer. By Sunday, Dell knew that they were going to meet with Johnny and they were going to go together to ride their bikes, um, motorcycles. <laughs> this is something they looked forward to and Johnny never showed up. That's when Dell knew that something was really wrong. I mean, Johnny was not the kind of guy to do that. I mean... He wasn't that kind of guy. Johnny was described as a good friend, thoughtful. I mean, he, at least he would call to let him know, you know what, I'm not going to go for that ride. Something happened and Dill knew it. So Dill and his wife, well, along with another friend, decided to go to Johnny's place. When they got there, he was not home. Everything was locked and they spotted Johnny's um, bike, bikes, I should say, uncover and in the parking garage of the building. So, this was super weird. He would not leave the bikes uncovered for that long. I'm not a bike person, so I have no idea why. I'm assuming, I don't know, the elements, sun, dust, I have no idea why, but that was something that immediately drew his attention. And I guess they're friends, so they know what they do and what they don't. Now, Monday comes around, and it's it was October the 13th, and Del receives an email from Johnny's email account. And it said something like, I met an extraordinary woman referring to Jen, of course, and she offered to take me to a tropical vacation in Costa Rica in her winter home. I will let you know the phone number soon. Don't worry, I won't be back until December 10th. See you around the holidays. I mean, that was not Johnny. I didn't write like him, did not end it with a joke or a funny thing like he used to. The way that... Uh, I'm not sure. I didn't understand if Johnny would sign his name in the end and this email was not signed with his name or if he's, you know, if whoever wrote this put Johnny in the bottom and he usually didn't write his name. There was something off about that. So Dell, knowing that this was not Johnny, decided to reply to this email and saying, but who's going to take your brother to the airport? Johnny did have a brother, but nobody needed to take or pick up the brother from the airport. Um, he just said that or wrote that, hoping that whoever was pretending to be Johnny would try to say something like he knew about it and kind of catch the guy in lie because, again, Johnny's brother was not coming and Johnny knew that. So Johnny or whoever was impersonating, impersonating him never replied. So Dell went to the police and he said that somebody was impersonating his friend. He says that he's going to Costa Rica. That's not like him. Something really bad is going on. Please look into it. The police at first were like, let the guy live a little, you know? He's an adult, 
He's going on a, away on vacation. Let the guy have some fun. You have nothing to prove that the guy is in trouble. So this is not something we can help you with, basically. Now, after that, Johnny's presence online was even stronger. He updated his Facebook page, changed his profile picture. I don't know if it was in an email or, or something. He deleted his profile in the dating website. It seemed like he was just fine, but not home. On Tuesday, uh, he emails his boss with a very short resignation letter. The boss replies to this email saying, where should I send your last check then? Never got an answer. By Wednesday, Dave had enough calls. I mean, he, he had enough. and He's been talking to his friends and people are receiving emails from Johnny. And he knew that he had to go back to the police and try to file a report. I mean, he knows his friend is in serious trouble. And that the last time that anybody seen him or talked to him was that Friday when he was going to meet with Jen. So he calls the police again. They say, we're sending somebody to take your statement. But nobody shows up. They stood him up. So he decides to break into Johnny's apartment. If the guy was leaving the country, there should have been signs of him picking up, picking up clothes, passport, computer, suitcase, or a bag. I mean, Dell needed something to prove to the police that, listen, my friend didn't leave the country with this girl. Something bad happened to him. When he got inside Johnny's apartment, I mean, it didn't look like a, like he came back. Um, especially not back to get ready his place for him being away on a long trip. There were dishes in the sink. There was food in the fridge. There were some covers, like, just put in there. Something that most people, and especially Johnny, would have thrown away or something if he was going to be away for a long time. His luggage was still there, his toiletries, and the most interesting thing is the passport. How is he going to leave the country without a passport? He checks the garage again, the bikes are still there, and they're still not covered, so he knew he wouldn't leave them like that for two months. Bell calls the police again and they finally take him seriously and uh, started to contact everyone that Johnny knew, family, friends, and they ask around and the last time anybody heard from him was that last Friday before he went on that date. After that, it was just a bunch of online things, but no contact. Now the police at the same time, they check with customs in Costa Rica. They check airport garages for to see if his car was there. Airlines, nothing. So, Dell starts explaining to the police the circumstances under how Johnny met this friend, Jen. And he also explained that she didn't give him an address, but directions to a detached garage, everything. The police decides to follow the directions and started by asking around in the neighborhood. They explained that it's a rental property. The neighbors do explain that. that the owner rents the house to some people in the garage, the detached garage to a guy who was using it as a studio for his movies. When they were asked about this Jen girl, they said, we don't know any Jen. Now, they asked around and they end up getting the name of the guy that 
was renting the detached garage. His name was Mark Twitchell. So they went to talk to this guy. He says he doesn't know any Jen, really. And because it was a studio, you could see from the outside that the windows were blocked. And of course, that is because so they can manage the light inside, the lighting, and make sure that everything looks perfect. So the police asks, can we look inside? When they get to the door, this guy, Mark, points to a pallor. It, it was like a very bad... It was like somebody tried to change the lock, but they did such a horrible job that, you know, he says, I didn't change it, so I don't know what's going on. But the police unscrewed a couple of screws and they were in. And this was with Mark's permission. When they got in, it burnt, it smelled burnt inside. Um, they spot a stainless steel table. You probably are getting the vibes of Dexter now. On top of it, there was a receipt with maybe in other circumstances would have been very, very um, interesting to find those things and kind of a red flag. But in this case, in that receipt, there was a like an industrial solvent Plastic sheeting, gloves, paper towels. And again, this is a studio, so Mark explains that they are filming a horror movie. And that fake blood is made of corn syrup and food coloring. And if it's not removed immediately, it would attract bugs. So it would only make sense. And it's it almost seemed like... He wanted really to help this investigation. So he was answering every single question and everything that the guy said made sense. I don't know, just a friendly guy willing to help. When they take him to the station, they get the same idea. I mean, he starts talking about his wife, his daughter... He didn't have any kind of um, gesture or he didn't seem upset or he didn't seem worried or anything like that. So he was almost immediately put in the category of somebody who's willing to help and maybe not a person of interest. So they start digging in this movie, okay? They start to trying to find out the details about this scary movie or horror movie and it was about a serial killer and again this was not during that first interview but this was more of uh, an investigation so the, the guy in the movie was a serial killer who tortured and killed bad guys again sounds like Dexter and in the movie, the serial killer was a police officer who was turning into a serial killer for justice. Again, Dexter. Um, the idea was to punish, pu punish, punish, punish unfaithful husbands. And that he would lure them with a fake dating profile. Yeah, exactly. Weird. When they met for the first time, the husband gets confronted with a guy in a hockey mask, in a hoodie, who knocks him down, kill the guy, and then they make the family believe he's okay by updating online social media and stuff for the deceased. And they covered everything by saying that he went on a vacation rings a bell they have to go back to the garage they knew that I mean now that they knew what this movie was all about 
um, this didn't look right. But to a judge, it might not look right, but he doesn't care. He's not going to give you a search warrant unless there is probable cause or something they can use because despite what most people think, um, police can't really get into your house and check your house unless they have a search warrant. Now, they can seize your house, which is not the same as we have the power to go search it, but they can seize it. So there is, you know, there's a big difference between one and the other. Now, at that point, they were like, let's talk to Mark again, because he's such a friendly guy. He was so willingly, I don't know, helping us going to the station, explaining everything. Let's just go to the guy and say, can we go back inside the garage? He says, sure, why not? But before they get there, he starts explaining that a few weird things have been going on lately. That somebody broke into his car, stole papers, money. Then he went home and found his front door unlocked and in some articles it says that the door was open but nothing was missing i once came to my house after a 12 hour shift and i left my front door and my garage door open i mean I guess he didn't think of the idea that maybe his wife forgot about it. Maybe she uh, was in a hurry like I was that morning when he left everything open. I mean, other than dust, it was everything okay in my house. But apparently he thought that somebody broke broke into his house. But not really because they would have had to have a key because it was not forced entry. Then he explains to the police that he was sitting in a gas station and all of a sudden a guy knocks on his window and said, do you want to buy a car? Now, this car was a Mazda hatchback. This guy explains that he met a girl online, he was leaving the country and she said she would buy him a new one so he didn't need his old car anymore at that point mark the guy sitting in his car being approached by this other guy says i don't have enough money to buy a car here so this guy that approached him asked him how much do you have and then mark says forty dollars forty dollars is that even is that okay so the guy said sold (laughs) that's if that's not the stupidest conversation somebody can come up with i don't know what is to be honest (laughs) who's gonna sell you a car in i think it was somewhere written that it was about a ten thousand dollar car who's gonna give you for forty dollars i mean unless it was stolen and somebody was trying to put it on you i don't know it's just dumb i'm sorry but it just doesn't make sense i don't know how he thought the police was was gonna buy it no idea so he's asked to go back and write a statement at the station and mark goes with the police and takes two and a half hours to write an eight page statement where he now starts saying that he had a few things taken from his garage as well um burn drum supplies in general He rambles and rambles and rambles and he only takes 
I don't know, maybe a paragraph to explain really what the police wanted to know. But they can arrest him based on that. They push him and question him all night, but he doesn't break. But they decide to seize his house and car so the family cannot touch it. While they were working on getting a search warrant. And they can seize it. And they did that. Now Mark didn't like that because he wanted to get something from inside his car. But he lost his car at the station because that's when they seized it. They didn't have the power to go inside and look what was in it. But they could just make sure that he didn't remove anything from it. When they checked the house, when they finally got the search warrant, the evidence was piling. He had a Star Wars thing, stuff mixed with forensic stuff, Costa Rica information, and blank postcards. A scary looking hockey mask with what they thought were traces of blood. I mean, it was starting to look a lot like the movie they were working on. But it was becoming more real. In the car, when they finally got the warrant, they found handwritten post-it notes with to-do lists like destroy the wallet, ship phone while it's on, use laptop on open Wi-Fi, open Wi-Fi, and email friends and family. And it really was taking shape. And it was shaping into a horrible crime. In the trunk of the car there was a big big blood stain in the front seat he had his backpack with a military knife with dry blood on it his laptop had two temporary files of something that he tried to delete from his computer but was still saved by the computer and in one of those files um it was a I think the name was SK Confessions, 35 pages long, with details of how he lured the victim with lies on a dating website, how he was thinking about um, using unfaithful husbands, but that it was going to be easier if they were single guys because married guys would be noticed immediately that they didn't come back home and the wives would report the husbands. Which sounds a little bit weird, right? Because if we are trying to, uh, in his case, trying to find justice and get rid of people that deserve it, why would you get a single guy who's going on a date with a single girl? I mean, it didn't really make sense but at the same time it was almost like whatever works you know we would like to get rid of the cheating husbands but if that is going to be a problem for us let's just do single guys and the details and you know it it went on and on and on with details and gruesome um explain in a way that it again it was almost like he was writing a confession to the police um he mentions his wife tess and the daughter zoe and his wife i mean this guy's a genius okay his wife's name is jess not tess and his daughter's name, it's Chloe, not Zoe. So, now you're starting to see that this 
character maybe is more alive than we thought. He then goes to tell how he cuts the victims in pieces and dumps them in sewer lines. I mean, right. This guy can't really get any better than that. Um, there is also another piece of something that can help the police. Because here it says that a week before Johnny, another guy went and he got away. Apparently, they lured him with a profile, and once he got to the uh, garage, he was approached by the man with a hockey mask. They started fighting, and he finally escaped. The guy in the hockey mask was going after him, but when this other guy got out, there was a couple walking the dog, so he let him go. But why didn't the victim report it? Well, police speculated at first that maybe he was married. But now we know that Johnny was not the first guy. At this point, they had more than enough for a search warrant for the garage and they got it immediately. Once they got in, they found everything covered in blood, including a metal pipe. They also found cleaning supplies, a game processing kit with dried blood on it. Uh, Mark was not a hunter, especially not a big animal kind of hunter. And the blood spatter tells the story that somebody was killed there. And that person was beaten to death with a steel pipe covered in hockey tape. That's what it seemed like and that's what was around. On October 31st, 2008, Mark was arrested and charged with first degree murder and attempted murder for the guy that after the police showed the mask to the media, this guy went to the station and explained that it happened to him. He described everything that happened and it matched exactly to what Mark wrote in that sick confession. Eventually, Mark confessed that he killed Johnny, but he pled not guilty. He said that this was supposed to be a PR stunt. But he also said that Johnny got angry when he realized that Jen was not there and they started to fight and Mark killed him in self-defense. He said that then while she was while he was in shock, he cut the guy into pieces. And he also said that he was a good guy that made a horrible mistake. Okay? So he's talking about himself as a good guy. By November of that same year, the wife, and I'm talking about Mark's wife, divorced him. She discovered that he had been cheating with an ex-girlfriend and that he quit his day job a long time ago, but he still leave the home at the same time and came back at the same time, tricking her into believing that he was working. Just to make things worse, he planned to get away with Johnny's murder. And in that confession, he had two more names. An ex-girlfriend's ex-boyfriend and an ex-boss of his. He got life in prison and has possibility of parole 25 years later. Now, they didn't have a body at first, and it was kind of hard to prove without a doubt that he did it. But eventually, for whatever reason, he decided to take them to where he dumped the body, and the police did find half of Johnny, and he was in a sewer, 
couple blocks away from Mark's parents' home. Who, by the way, tried to burn Johnny at his parents' home. It didn't work, so he got worried and decided to drop him in the sewer. Um, police believed that it was big part, bless you girl, big part of his body was just gone. Bless you. And, um, but the part of it still remained there. So, you know, you start to wonder. I mean, okay, the media made him look like, okay, you know, this guy, you know, the Dexter killer. I mean, this was popular around the world at the time. Um, journalists, you know, everybody was putting the attention on this guy who they say looks like that, looks like Dexter. Or the actor from Dexter, I should say. I don't know. Maybe there's a resemblance. I don't see it. But perhaps. I think that the guy from Dexter is more... I don't know. I think he looks better than this guy here. I don't know. I, I guess you should look him up and see if <laughs> if he does look like him. But... The media cover that part over and over again. How much he resembled Dexter. And, or at least the actor from Dexter. And it was pretty weird that people can see so many similarities in the way that he did things. That he, they, they almost can see how they even look alike. Uh, to me, it's just sick. And... If I haven't finished Dexter, it's because it got to a point that it was getting to me. Because even though a lot of for a lot of people, this guy Dexter on TV is a genius and he's so smart and he's getting away with stuff and he's also being just or he's taking justice in his hands and it to me it got to the point where like well this is a very sick person because if you really have to do that in order to feel some sense of justice then you're probably not probably but you're a hypocrite because if you are doing that if you're killing people even if they're bad people by you killing that makes you one of them the bad guys and who's gonna take care of you you know if we're going to say an eye for an eye then we have to put ourselves in that we can't just put ourselves in a pedestal and think oh no I'm doing this because there's not because because if you're doing some things wrong you're doing things wrong according to this Dexter character he doesn't care your reason why you're being a bad person or why you're a criminal or why you're killing people. You deserve to die, according to Dexter. But, well, who's going to take care of Dexter? Because he's not a good guy. He can work for the police. He, he can help investigations. But he's not being honest. He's not being truthful. He's hiding things from, you know, his his work. And then on top of that, he is doing something that is not right. So he's also, in a way, a bad guy. But some people that it's, you know, so in love with the show can't really see it because of the narrative of the story. And, you know, the way that Dexter thinks and how he's kind of a different kind of guy and but almost like expecting people to excuse the things that he does because he's trying to get justice and where is it 
Where are we going to draw the line for justice? And I guess when I tried to explain this to my husband, we were talking about it when I stopped watching the show, which by the way, he didn't like. Um, I, 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 I told him, you know, I like the, the idea of doing something about it, about doing something um, for the system, but that's not the way to do it. And, uh, if you're a bright mind and if you're smart enough to, you know, maybe try to use it in a way that you can help them catch the bad guys. And I understand that justice is not perfect and the justice system is not, it's far from perfect. But at the same time, I feel like, okay, so we don't think it's okay that that person is killing somebody else. But we are okay with the idea that somebody can do that to them because they're a bad guy. That's where things, when things start to get confused, uh, confusing. And I think it kind of shapes our minds in a way that for some people who is not in the best position can make them think that this is a good thing to try. And I'm not blaming the show. I'm not blaming anything. I think this was more of a... uh, That the media made it bigger than it should have been. Um, The similarities and... The way that he became famous for it. It almost looked like him too. You know, that was all the media out there. Um, so it kind of shows that we're exposed to so many different things. For some of us, we can still make the decision to say, hey, this is, this is not right. This is not what I want to be watching. This is not what I want my brain to think. And this is just not right. For some other people, they can detach themselves from reality and watch the show and enjoy it, as I did for for a long time. And there's also some other people that can be influenced when they're not in the right place to follow some things that are so sick and so twisted. The idea was to punish people for doing the wrong thing but then in the end that didn't really matter they didn't want to do it because they didn't want to get caught or he didn't want to get caught he just wanted to do it and that was his excuse it's 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 such a it's such a contradicting thing and it really put me into a thinking mode into are we really being that hypocrite that we can see people doing wrong things and clearly see it but we can't see them when we are doing those wrong things like in real life this guy couldn't see it that he was basically the bad guy then somebody else would have to choose the chase him and do that to him if that was the case and if that's how the world would work in the end he thought that he was smarter that he actually is because he was not ready he didn't think this through he didn't plan things right he just wanted to get it done just a sick mind and there was a few you know things that made me think for a little bit and try to to fathom 
or even imagine another scenario. But、uh, like the fact that in some reports he did call Dale and say, "Hey, I'm here, but Jen is not here. There's a guy who's a filmmaker." So then there are some other things or articles that say he got there, knocked. The guy in the hockey mask came out, knocked him down, and killed him. So, if he did in fact call Dale and say, "Hey, yes, I'm here. There's a filmmaker guy. Jen is not here. Blah blah blah." Did they have an altercation? I'm, I'm not excusing Mark, not at all. And then this other guy that. Got away the week before. Didn't he just? I don't know. I don't know. Why didn't he say something? Well, he said he was ashamed that somebody pulled a prank on him. So it was not hard enough. I mean, wasn't you know the hard for you to get out that you thought, hey, they were not gonna kill me. They were just pranking me. So many things, and and so many possibilities. But in the end, by showing, by opening the garage for that second time, by coming up with the stupidest story of buying a car for forty dollars, and by not thinking things through, I think that's how he got caught. And see,、so、he was trying to emulate, and he was trying to do things like this guy Dexter, who's super smart and who gets away with everything because he's super smart. And I'm not saying that I wish he had the brains to do it and pull it off. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying this guy, this character Dexter, he's a super smart guy. He's Smarter than most people. That's why he gets away with things in the show. But Mark, not the brightest kid in town. I mean, you can see how he was leaving traces. That he was writing things on his computer about every single detail and how he did things. He was just a sick, sick guy. Anyways, this is the kind of case that leaves me always wondering, and it—I don't know—it makes me think if we have too much time, if life has gotten so much easier with things being so fast and being so instant, instant internet, you know, dry cleaners and food delivery and grocery delivery, and、uh, that we're just. Now we can save so much time that unless we're spending all the time working, I don't know if people just have nothing to do but come up with the craziest things, like this one. So, anyways, what do you think about this case? Do you think that he really did call? Or is that something that they added later on? Do you think there was an alter altercation? The police. There was a a time that they believe actually that they were making a film that it's based on something that's going on, like like、uh, you know they they grab this guy, they kill this guy in camera, and then they sell it for millions and millions of dollars. I guess that was never proven to be true, but they also thought of that. Such a crazy case. So, <laughs> anyways, thank you so much for being here today, guys. I truly appreciate the support. I hope you have a wonderful week. I'll see you back here next Sunday with a new true crime case. Talk to you guys soon. Bye, guys.